Today with Joseph Prince. If you're a sinner, guess what? Jesus says, I'm a saviour. But you, Lord, you don't understand, I'm a bad sinner. He said, I'm a great saviour. But I, I'm a, I have a, my, my sin goes deep. And he says, my love goes deeper still. You don't understand, my, my sin is great. He says, my grace is greater. So only when you acknowledge you're a sinner, God, Jesus says, I'm a friend of sinners. I'm the saviour of sinners. But you say, I'm okay, I'm okay. I didn't come for the okay people. I came for those who say they are sinners. Always remember that the Lord always exceeds your, He answers exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask of things. So think big and He must exceed it. Think even bigger and He must exceed it. Do you remember the story of the, the woman at the well? Jesus gently exposed her in her sins. Why? Well, because he wanted her to feel loved. Every time you pretend to be something you are not, you cannot feel loved. So, for example, when you are dating, you put your best foot forward, you always try to leave a good impression, right? Amen? I mean, you keep all your bodily functions in check. <laughs> you behave, you have your, you know, you don't burp. Amen? You put your best foot forward. Now, it's okay for, for the first date and the second and maybe the third. But after you get to know each other and you are contemplating on a serious relationship, even leading to marriage, you got to be yourself. Amen? You got to let the person know what you like, what you don't like. You got you to know that the person is falling in love. Let's say both of you are falling in love with each other. You got to know that you're falling in love with the real person. Or else you never feel love. For example, let's say uh, you're dating and then you don't like uh, broccoli. I use broccoli as an example, okay? But you, because your, your, your girlfriend loves broccoli. So when, when she gives you broccoli or you go, you know, to a restaurant, you're eating broccoli, oh, she says, I love broccoli. Say, me too. Everything is me too. Me too, you know? That, that stage is the stage where, you know, uh, you know, before marriage, a guy can spend the whole night staying awake thinking about what she said. <laughs> what she means by that. After marriage, he falls asleep while she's still talking. You know, <laughs> okay, that's a difference. But <laughs> anyway, so while you're dating, you say, I love broccoli. Then after you get married, maybe a few months into the marriage, right, you are eating out or you are somewhere and she, she serves you a lot of broccoli. You say, well, everyday broccoli. Yeah. Then he says, yeah, you, we love broccoli, don't we? Right, Our, your favorite food. No, I hate broccoli. You say, you what? I hate broccoli. That's not what you said. Oh, I, well, I, I, I always hate broccoli since I was young. No, that's not what you said. Okay, guys, always remember, never argue with a woman when she's tired <laughs> and when she's rested. <laughs> <laughs> so, a problem ensues. Now, the, 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 the problem is something, it's not, it's not this, it's that even going to a fundamental fact is that you cannot feel loved if you think the person is falling in love with an image. An image you project. All right? It's not the real you. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, before you go on a date, you know, you put on your, your wig and then put your eyeball in, put your false teeth. Amen? Then on the wedding night, <laughs> like, 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 you know? <laughs> I'm not referring to that extreme, okay? By the way, all these things are real, okay? Except for this one here. Hang on. Huh? Put it back. Okay. It is, it is the fact that you will never feel love if you think the person is falling in love with an image. So what Jesus did at the well was this. He told the woman, go call your husband here. Then she said, I have no husband. Now it's coming to her sin, right? But this is how beautifully he did it. How, how courteously, how excellent in the way he did it, how loving and kind. He praised her first. He did a divine sandwich. He praised her first. He says, you have said it beautifully. In the Greek, kalos, beautiful. You have said it beautifully. You have no husband. You have had five husbands. 
and the one that you're living with now is not your husband. Then he put the other divine sandwich. In that, you have spoken truthfully. Now, who talks like that? We'll say, you've got five husbands, man, don't lie. You know, <laughs> right? He, he prays her. He says, you have spoken beautifully. You have spoken be literally, chalos, beautifully. You have had no husband. You had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not your husband. He found a way to praise her, and he was courteous to her. Now she knows that he knows about her and still loved her. The Bible says Jesus went through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. She was a Samaritan woman. Most Jews will not travel the same way Jesus traveled. They will bypass Samaria. But the Bible says it very beautifully. He needed to go through Samaria. It was not a topographical need. It was a grace need. Amen? He had an appointment with that woman. He wanted to love her, to save her. And Jesus was sitting at the well. And now the woman knew that of all the women in Samaria, Jesus knew all about her, and he's still talking to her, revealing himself as the Messiah, revealing him and talking to her. Now she knows that he knows about her and he loves her. Does she feel loved? Now she knows that he knows, that she knows he knows. <laughs> Do you think she feels loved? Of course. When you know everything about, the, you know, we tell couples all the time when they come and they're in the honeymoon stage, oh, Pastor Prince, he's such a lovey-dovey, oh, he's such a sweetie pie. And then, go fight, go quarrel, argue as much as you want first, then come back and see us. Right? No, we want to get married. No, fight first. No, in essence, we don't say that. But of course, we know that they are in that stage. It's not ready for marriage yet. Amen? Now, after a, 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 a few months, whatever, they come back and they say that, no, oh, man, I can't stand him, man, you know. <laughs> but I still love him. Now, let's analyze the can't stand part, okay? And you find that you still love each other. After you see the bad in, the, in, the, in the, each other, then you know that this is a good criteria for marriage. The reason why Jesus was strong against hypocrisy is that the Pharisees, as long as they put up that facade, that, 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 that veneer, they cannot feel love. They cannot feel the love of God. It's like, it's like uh, you know, you're hiding away from the… You, you, want, you want to get a suntan, but you are hiding away from the sun. No, you got you to uh, uh, remove every veil, every hindrance, every blockage to the sun. So Jesus in His rebuke will remove all that so that they will, they will, they will know that He knows them as they are and still loves them. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, found that out. That Jesus knows all about him and loved him. And he allowed the love of God to penetrate his heart while the others didn't. Are you with me so far? As long as you pretend to be what you are not, you cannot feel the love of God. And the love of God is the only thing that will cast out your fear and transform you. Amen. So, when it comes to Understanding law and grace. Wisdom in Proverbs 9 verse 1 says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. The seven pillars are actually the seven things you need to know to understand the entire Bible, to understand God's plan and purposes for the earth and to understand where you fit in. Okay? Seven pillars are the seven dispensation, seven dispensations in of the Bible. There are seven dispensations. I've taught on that. You can get my message on that. And then the seven feasts of Israel. Jesus died on the feast day. He rose again on the feast day. So there are feasts in Israel that, that hides truths. Seven feasts of Israel. Then we have the seven mysteries of the kingdom of heaven that we need to understand in Matthew 13. Then we have the seven churches of the book of Revelation. You understand all this? And this has got to do with the church. Where are seven feasts got to do with Israel? When you understand all this, you understand God's plan and purposes for the Jew, for the Gentile, and for the earth. By the way, when God looks on, on the earth, God sees only three groups of people. Jew, Gentile, or the church. Made up of Jew or Gentile. Only three groups of people when God looks down. And the whole Bible is dealing with either the Jew, the Gentile, the Jew on the most part, of the Gentile, and also the church in the New Testament. Are you with me so far? And, and the confusion comes when we put ourselves in the wrong dispensation. But the, the problem is this. When you look at your Old, your Old Testament and your New Testament, your Bible is divided into two, right? Old Testament and New Testament. 
Old Testament predominantly is the, if, instead of seven dispensation, we just summarized the dispensation of the law, which lasted for 1,500 years, and the dispensation of grace, which lasted for 2,000 years. So what is the dispensation of the law? When God gave to Israel the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai, that was the starting of the dispensation of the law. It lasted for 1,500 years until Jesus came. And then now, but it didn't start yet when Jesus was born and when He walked on the earth. It started on the day of Pentecost. Okay? And on the day of Pentecost until now is 2,000 years. Grace is longer than law. Praise God. And what is grace defined as? Today, there are people who try to redefine grace. But let me tell you, the Bible says in Romans 11, and if it's by grace, it's no more of the law of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Very simple. In other words, undeserved, unmerited favor. You cannot work for it. It's by grace. So the opposite of grace is works. And yet grace produces the best kind of works. Not date works, but living works. Life works. Hallelujah. Now I want to show you something that is causing confusion in the church. And because of that, people start writing against extreme grace. You know, Pastor Prince is preaching extreme grace and things like that because they don't understand this divine paradox. Let me explain. In Proverbs 17 verse 15, it says this, He who who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. You know what's an abomination? There is sin. We're all born in sin. Even before we do anything, we are born in sin because of Adam's sin. It's in the blood. Okay? Then we, there's also transgression. When you break a known law, that's transgression or trespass. Then there's iniquity that's passed down from father to child. Iniquity, a perversion in the nature. There's abomination. Abomination is the worst kind. Abomination is like, it's abominable. It's, it's not snowman, okay? It's abomination. It's terrible, the worst kind, okay? Now, what, according to this verse, what's the worst kind? There's an abomination to the Lord. Both, this. If you justify the wicked, let's say a, a person is a wicked person, a sinner, but you justify him, you talk about him as if he's a justified man, a righteous man. That's an abomination. On the other hand, he who condemns the just, let's say a just person, a righteous person, you condemn him, that's an abomination to the Lord. Are you listening, people? Now, we always think in terms of other people, right? But what about yourself? If you are a sinner and you justify yourself like the Pharisees, right? I, I, I don't need any saving, you know? I, I'm pretty okay, I'm moral. I keep the law. I don't do bad things and all that. You are justifying the wicked. You are justifying the sinner. God says you're a sinner. And no problem. If you're a sinner, guess what? Jesus says, I'm a savior. But you, Lord, you don't understand. I'm a bad sinner. He said, I'm a great savior. But I, I'm a, I have a, my, my sin goes deep. And he says, my love goes deeper still. You don't understand. My, my sin is great. He says, my grace is greater. So only when you acknowledge you're a sinner, God, Jesus says, I'm a friend of sinners. I'm the savior of sinners. But you say, I'm okay, I'm okay. I didn't come for the okay people. I came for those who say they are sinners. I think he said, those who are well don't need a doctor. It's those who are sick, Jesus said. So when you take this position, you are, you are justifying the sinner, even if it's yourself. That's an abomination. When you're not yet saved. On the other hand, now that you are saved, the blood of Jesus has cleansed you. Amen. And the Bible says, what are you now? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, real quick. You all know this verse by now. God made Jesus at the cross who knew no sin to become our sin, right? That we might be made, that we might become, that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Him. So what are we now? The righteousness of God in Him. But if you condemn the righteous, even the self-condemnation, you condemn yourself. When God has made you righteous, you condemn yourself. You say, I'm a lousy sinner. I'm, I'm this, I'm that. You condemn yourself. It's also an abomination to the Lord. Have you ever considered that? What God has cleansed, don't you dare call unclean, including yourself. 
The problem is that this is hypocrisy, pretending to be what you are not. He's a sinner, but he refused to admit he's a sinner. So he puts layers of morality and good works and good standing, family standing, try to be somewhat in society or whatever, just to cover up the fact he's a sinner. But God says you're a sinner, but no problem. I sent Jesus to be your Savior. Jesus is a Savior of sinners. If you're not a sinner, you don't qualify. Amen. You don't qualify for His saving power. The leper has all title to Him, to His grace, because the leper is a leper. Huh? In fact, he knew the Lord was able. He, he just wasn't sure the Lord is willing to use His power on His behalf. That's why he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't doubt His ability. He doubted His willingness. And the Lord confirmed that once and for all. I am willing. By the way, Jesus touched Him, right? Jesus didn't have to touch Him. He didn't ask, Lord, if you're willing, touch me. But Jesus always exceeds our expectations. He always over answers our requests. Amen. I asked God for a wife. He gave me Wendy. Where are you, baby? Amen. Amen. I asked God for a ministry and God gave me a super church. Always remember that the Lord always exceeds your, He answers exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So think big and He must exceed it. Think even bigger and He must exceed it. Don't ask God for small things. Don't ask God for a job. Ask God for a position. Ask God for big things and you compliment Him. You compliment Him. You speak great things and you're praising Him when you ask God for big things. Amen. Are you listening, people? So, Hypocrisy is pretending to be what you are not. There's a woman of Canaan. Say Canaan. Jesus went up to the north near the uh, sea coast, near the Lebanon area, where Tyre and Sidon was. The Bible says Jesus went to the regions of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are two very famous cities during the time of Alexander the Great. They were known, very famous, and one, one of them is an island, and, and how Alexander conquered the island, he actually built a, a, a rampart all the way, made, made real stones. You can still see, see the stones today in that place, under the, under the sea, still see the stones. But, but that place was demolished by Alexander the Great by the time Jesus was there, up in the north, and he was in this region of Tyre and Sidon, not just a small city. And a woman from that area, she was a Canaanite, a non-Jew. Not just a non-Jew, a Canaanite is under the ban of a curse. Noah cursed Canaan specifically. Noah, when realizing that Canaan uncovered his nakedness, he cursed Canaan and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be. And uh, Israel was called to execute judgment on the Canaanites. The Canaanites will introduce them to all kinds of idolatries and all kinds of perversions and abominations. And God commanded uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament to judge the Canaanites. Now, the thing is this, this is a Canaanite woman. And she came to Jesus. And the Bible says this, that she said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me, for my daughter is severely demonized. The word severely is there. She is greatly in the King James. Your new King James is severely tormented by an, a demon. So she has a daughter that's demon-possessed. And she came to Jesus and says, Son of David! Lord, Son of David! Now, she's coming on pretense that she is a Jew. She's not a Jew. She's a Canaanite. But she knew that the phrase, Son of David, can only be used by the Jews. Now understand this, God's salvation plan is for the whole world. For God so loved the world, not just the nation of Israel, that God gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But God must first keep His promises to all the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to all the promises He made to the nation of Israel. So when He sent Jesus Christ, He sent Jesus to Israel to fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Amen. So when Jesus came, before He died on the cross, His salvation was only for the nation of Israel. And all the miracles He did was specifically mainly for Israel, but there were Gentiles who got healed and received. And we, we, we'll show you why. It was not their time. This Canaanite woman came to Jesus pretending to be a Jew, and she said, Lord, Son of David, uh, Son of David is a phrase used by the Jew 
on their Messiah. Now for us, we got saved receiving Jesus, believing in Him as Saviour. But the Jew gets saved in believing Him as the Messiah. The Son of David. Are you with me so far? By the way, that's why we only have out of four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we only have two Gospels that talk about His genealogy. Alright, Matthew and Luke. Matthew emphasizes Jesus' kingship as a Jew, the king of the Jews. Amen. Whereas, whereas uh, Luke's gospel proclaims Jesus as the perfect man, the son of man. His manhood is called upon. And that's why in, in Luke, his genealogy is traced all the way to Adam, the first man. Whereas in Matthew, the gospel, uh, genealogy of Jesus in chapter 1 is traced all the way to Chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 1, the son of Jesus Christ, the generation of Jesus, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. But again, the chronology is not right, right? David came after Abraham, not Abraham after David. And yet it says the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why David came first? Because David was God's appointed king. And from David's line will come Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Matthew is about Jesus as king of the Jews. So it's about son of David, son of Abraham. He's a king and he's a Jew from the line of Abraham. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's go on. All right. So here we have a situation. The woman came pretending that she's a Jew, calling him by the Jewish title, son of David, have mercy on me. God cannot bless you on a pretense. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. He bears witness with the truth. So the Bible says, the Lord answered her, not a word. Not a word. And she came after the Lord and his disciples says, Lord, please send her away. She's troubling us. And she kept on telling the Lord, son of David, son of David. And then the Lord said this, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You heard that? I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because at that point in time, in his earthly walk, he came for Israel. If only Israel had believed, all Israel will be saved and Jesus will be ruling in, in, in Jerusalem today. Hmm? And Jerusalem is becoming a hot topic again because that's when Jesus comes back, His millennial rule. After the rapture, there'll be seven years of tribulation on earth and then He'll come back to rule and where He's going to rule from? Jerusalem. It is not about your works, your doings. It's not about your performance that saves you is what Christ has done. So if God is supplying all the time, our posture is to sit down, believe and receive. Request Joseph's latest four CD audio series, Out of Darkness Into the Light, as a thank you for your gift of any amount to the ministry. Do you find yourself constantly weighed down by cares and worries? Learn what it means to rest in God and watch Him open up all of heaven's supply to meet the needs in your life. Gain a deeper understanding of how God's love is your way out of every fear and discouragement when you request the No Fear in Love gift collection for a specific gift to the ministry. You have been waiting for results in a certain area of your life, but you're wondering, how long, oh Lord, how long? I'm seeing so many good things happening to people, but not to me. Well, you know, God cares for you. God loves you. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. He knows exactly what you're going through. He loves you. And I believe that He has given me a word that's going to set you free, It's going to help you. Don't miss this limited time offer. Call us toll free at 1-877-901-4300 or visit josephprince.org today. So I've been a yo-yo dieter my whole life. I decided to put Joseph's teaching to the test and I thought, okay, I can't do this. I can't lose weight, I can't do it by myself. And I just, it was like I just went hands off. And I just walked out of it. I'm in peace and I'm such a different person. I'm so happy, I'm so content. And it's like, I'm excited on what's gonna happen next in my life. My wife was pregnant. She developed cervical cancer. We decided we are not gonna believe the doctor's report. We're gonna believe the truth about what God says about us. So we began to worship Jesus and take communion at home. That same day, the symptoms began to diminish and within five days she was completely healed. I just want to thank you, thank Pastor Joseph Prince uh, for the message that he brings. Dear friend, thank you for opening up your heart to receive the gospel of grace. If like many, this precious message of grace has touched your life, 
Would you like to join us in impacting more people and see their lives change? Wendy and I can begin to tell you how blessed we are by testimonies of breakthroughs and victory over bondages and defeat through the hearing of the gospel. Recently, I received this encouraging testimony from Philip, who lives in Texas. He shared with us how hearing the gospel has delivered him from over 30 years of addiction, guilt, and shame. I love how Philip said it in his own words. Today, sin no longer has dominion over me. All my unclean habits have stopped. It is testimonies like these that really encourage us. We are so thrilled for Philip and for others with stories like this. When people encounter the gospel of grace, they experience true inside-out transformation. This is why I am passionate about getting the gospel of grace to reach many more people around the world. And I invite you to join us in this mission. Will you pray about being a Grace Revolution partner today? Together, we can reach more people and help them transform their lives with the love of Jesus. God bless you, and we are praying for you. Dear friends, together we can impact the world for Jesus. Partner with us and be part of this exciting Grace Revolution. Call us toll free at 1-877-901-4300 or visit us at josephprince.org slash partner today. Next on Joseph Prince. A question was asked Jesus by one of the lawyer of the Pharisees asking Jesus, which is the greatest of all the commandments? Then Jesus says, Hear, O Israel. That's how it starts, the greatest commandment. The Lord your God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. God sent His Son, and His Son loved us with all His heart, all His soul, all His mind, all His strength and gave His life for us. And now we love because He first loved us. So God gave us preachers and teachers, ministers in the pulpit that will open up the love of God to the people. Not saying, not preaching the law, saying you got to love God, you got to love God. But declaring the love of God, unveiling the love of God, and proclaiming the beauties and the glories and the excellencies of our Lord Jesus Christ. That takes the Holy Spirit. To teach, do good, get good, do bad, get bad, doesn't take the Holy Spirit. It's easy to preach there. It takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the anointing of God to proclaim the loveliness of Jesus, to elucidate on the grace of God, and the love of God. Joseph Prince Ministries is a Section 501c3 nonprofit organization, and your gift is tax deductible for the amount that exceeds any fair market value of the materials you receive from us. 